Welcome to Unscripted with Russo. For our podcast, we decided to explore the people behind the narratives. I'll introduce decision makers and influencers and find out the intimate story behind their rise to success. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Unscripted with Russo. I am here with Dr. Tina Richardson, one of my dear friends from Penn State Lehigh Valley. She's the chancellor over there. And uh, Tina, it's so good to have you here. It is so good to be here, Ashley. And this is exciting. I've heard this is your very first podcast. It is indeed. It's fun to have firsts, right? (laughs) It is. I promise we'll make it painless. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, to get started, a lot of people know you because of Penn State or your work at Lehigh, but I want to go back in time a little bit. Tell people a little bit about where you grew up and a little bit about your family. You've got a big family. So I absolutely have a big family. I am the ninth of 10 kids. That is amazing. The ninth of 10 kids. And what's the span from top to bottom? How many years? 17 years. Oh, my gosh. How do you have 10 kids in 17 years? I have no idea. I did not want to uh, repeat the model. (laughs) And where did you grow up? I grew up in in Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. Okay. What was it like being the ninth child? I mean, were you mischievous? Were you the baby? What was kind of your role in the family? So I was next to the baby, um, so I only had to be responsible for one other person other than myself. And I will say that being the ninth child means you have no power. (laughs) You have the ability to establish relationships and get people to be um, interested in what you're interested in by first getting to know them and what they want. Well, that's interesting. Okay. And was your family kind of paired off? I mean, you mentioned being responsible. Were you responsible for those behind you or underneath you? Or did you have groupings of like the first few and then the middle few? So so it turns out that, uh, you know, the first five kids were a year apart. Okay. And they kind of clustered together. My oldest sister, who was the second uh, child, she was really the one that had the most power and was in charge. My brothers, um, regardless of where they fell in the, in the birth order, they could just hang out and enjoy life. They didn't have <laughs> any real responsibilities for other people. Um, but we made sure that they were sensitive and caring and and um, considerate. But that was pretty much all of their responsibility, <laughs> just, to, just to be there, be fun. Um, but with with regard to the the clusters, the the first four clustered together. The next two uh, were actually born uh, the same year, if you could imagine, January and December. I just can't imagine being your mother. I mean, <laughs> exactly. that's the piece that's hard for me to imagine. And then the, the last uh, few kids were um, pretty much. Uh, I, I would say my parents were probably getting tired around the time the eighth, ninth, and tenth child came. Did that mean that you got away with more, Tina? Well, I observed. So I was more the introvert. I watched what other people did. I enjoyed their mischief, but I didn't actually get into very much myself. Okay. And what kind of kid were you? If we were to describe yourself, you know, kind of grammar school, middle school, what were you into? Were you went to school? Were you into activities? So I loved music, and so I learned to play the flute. But it turned out that I loved earning money more than I loved to play the flute. (laughs) So my sisters would pay me not to practice. You're kidding. Because they didn't want to hear it. (laughs) Apparently, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. (laughs) And so um, I remember there came a time where I took the money. (laughs) But but I always loved music. So I went from learning to play the flute to singing. And I actually um, sang at different people's weddings and other events. Um, But my youngest sister, out of all of us, had the most flexibility. So she actually studied music theater, which was never allowed for the rest of us. We had to do something that was supposedly convertible to a real job. (laughs) And she got to pursue that dream of music. Absolutely. And so uh, I'd love to sing with her because she uh, went on to have a a professionally trained voice and uh, went on to then um, study arts administration and become an attorney. That is amazing. I would imagine with so many kids in the family that everybody was kind of jockeying for position. And also, you had the maybe advantage of seeing uh, eight kids prior develop and what they would go into. What kind of influence did that have on you and and your career path and and what you wanted to do in life? So I absolutely had an opportunity to see um, the the trials, the tribulations, the mistakes, the mischief of of my my siblings. Um, More than anything else, though, I had 
eight individuals ahead of me that shaped my my uh, education and my career path in, in a lot of ways. So we all went to college. We all put ourselves through. However, um, when you have sisters who become uh, school teachers and you have brothers who are very protective, they make sure you stay on a path. And so I was fortunate that um, I started taking um, college classes in high school. And uh, that was because my sister said, you're not, you're wasting too much of your time. And school's not challenging you enough. Uh, maybe she saw talent. Maybe it was punishment. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I then went on um, from high school to um, do my undergraduate. I think I was uh, 17 years old when I started college and then um, went directly from undergrad to earning a Ph.D. That is amazing. You know, my husband, coming from a large Italian family, always says that one of the benefits of having a lot of family around is that there's a lot of people to be accountable to. Yes. And when you kind of know a lot of people are watching, concerned, keep you know, maybe it kind of helps keep you on the right path. And it sounds like that was definitely your experience. It, it was absolutely the experience. Um, they they made sure we all had fun. We enjoyed each other. We all grew up together in the same house. So you can imagine how many activities was were already always. Well, you going. had a whole team. Anywhere you wanted <laughs> to go, you had the whole team. So your family up. showed up. You had the whole team. That was it. We can fill <laughs> that a exactly. baseball field. We can field a volleyball court. <laughs> I, I had one neighbor. I grew up on an unpaved road in a neighborhood, and they had eight kids. So there were two h houses, 18 oh my kids. Gosh. I mean, it was a phenomenal place to grow up. Um, that is amazing. Well, you mentioned going on to study in college. Tell me a little bit about what you studied. So I decided probably when I was about 11, 12 years old that I wanted to be a psychologist. And so I never really cared about the undergraduate degree. I, I realized that I needed a PhD. And so I, throughout my college career, earned the, uh, an undergrad degree in psychology and then um, was admitted directly into a PhD program. Wow. And counseling what, psychology. Wow, that's amazing. And so what were some of your early memories of first jobs or first experiences that you kind of look back and say those were pretty formative? <laughs> so I have to say that I have had all sorts of, of, of jobs over the years because, as I said, I had to put myself through school. So one of my first jobs was actually selling produce at a roadside stand. Really? And I then went on to sell Christmas trees. And I realized I could sell just about anything. Um, but I did not want to do that for a living. Isn't it funny? It's interesting. You find out you might be good at something, but if it's not something you feel passionate about, you don't really want to pursue it. Exactly. So what I had to do is to find out what my real passion was, and and it ultimately became education. Um, but in, on that path to figuring that out, I had a fellowship um, with the um, Department of Defense, and I used the, the job that I had there to pay for my undergraduate degree. I worked in training and career development. I um, also uh, developed affirmative action plans for various agencies within um, the Department of Defense. And then I was offered a job when I graduated, and I thought, wow. I think I want to go back to school. I don't, I don't, I'm not ready to work <laughs> <laughs> a 40 hour week. Um, I couldn't see myself doing that. And I had always been passionate about learning and education. So going on for the PhD that allowed me to become the psychologist that I wanted to be um, really positioned me to do a whole host of, of wonderful things from being a Fulbright scholar and traveling internationally to chairing the Committee on International Relations um, in Psychology and uh, chairing a committee at uh, the UN as a psychologist, working on interdisciplinary teams to do um, global and international work. So and many exciting things. Yeah. Well, they say it's not so much necessarily knowing what you want to do, but knowing what you don't want to do. And so exactly. that process of elimination. Well, we're going to take a quick break, Dr. Tina Richardson, and we will be back with you in just a minute. You guys are listening to Unscripted with Russo. Any time of year, the Lehigh Valley is an exceptional place for food, drink, and entertainment. Whether you're cooling off from the summer heat at Dutch Springs or shopping for just the right kind of gift at Chris Kindle Market, you will make memories all year round. 
For more information on what the Lehigh Valley has to offer, check out Discover Lehigh Valley's website at discoverlehighvalley.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Unscripted with Russo. I am here with Dr. Tina Richardson from Penn State Lehigh Valley. She's been telling us about her huge family, 10 children born in 17 years. Tina, that's always amazing <laughs> to me. I don't care how many times I hear it from you. I'll say it every time. Uh, and then kind of her, her career path. And you studied psychology, went on to get your Ph.D., and you had a very interesting career. How did you make the jump into higher education, and when did that start? So I was always um, grounded in, in the idea that I would be in higher ed. Uh, my mentor uh, was a research scholar that had national and international um, rep, uh, international reputation. And so um, she always saw me as someone who would follow in her footsteps to produce a lot of, of research and scholarship that would teach and mentor others. I saw a slightly different vision. I loved the research skills that I developed. I uh, loved the clinical skills that I uh, had, had uh, developed as a, as a psychologist. But I went on first to be a full-time uh, staff psychologist in a university counseling center. And I worked at uh, Kansas State University, the Little Apple. That's amazing. So you worked in the counseling center at a college, yes. and that was kind of your first dipping your toe into the water of higher ed. But what a different side of it you must have seen. I saw an entirely different side of it. Um, as, as, a, as a student of psychology, of counseling psychology, we always uh, saw other uh, counseling um, uh, patients. And I started uh, to see patients at the University of Maryland, where I attended as a student. And then I did an internship for a year at uh, Towson State University. And so leaving Towson State um, and going to Kansas State, that was familiar. But after being there for uh, some period of time, I realized that I missed teaching. And that's what landed me in the Lehigh Valley. Um, I was offered a job to teach in the counseling psychology program that had been newly formed. And um, I taught at Lehigh University for 20 years. That's amazing. I want to talk a little bit about being um, a professional and being a mom at the same time. So tell me a little bit about your family. <laughs> So I have two sons. Both of them are now in college. One is a senior um, and 21 years old, and the other is 20 years old and a sophomore. And I have to say that there's nothing more uh, humbling than being a parent. That is for sure. That is for sure. But, you know, it's it's a difficult journey regardless of what what life hands you or your choices or where you find yourself. That balance is so difficult. How did you kind of find having your boys, raising a family, figuring out your career path. And I think, were you, did you move in the process or the boys were born here? The boys were born here. In fact, I had my kids after I was a tenured professor at Lehigh University. And so when you talk about balance, I had my kids at a time in my career where I had already received tenure. I was already a senior faculty member. It just so happened that I started my, my career very young. So um, when I decided to have children, I had done a lot of the professional travel. I had the uh, international network. I was involved in, um, in uh, national governance for the American Psychological Association. And so when you talk about balance, um, I really already established myself. And so there was nothing more important to me at that time than being a mother. That's awesome. That's so great to have had that in, in, almost in chapters so that you could focus on what you were doing at that time, which is which is really a nice, a nice thing. Tell me a little bit about what you taught at Lehigh and your time there. So in my, at my time at Lehigh, I taught um, – master's level and PhD level classes in counseling psychology. My area of research was uh, <laughs> racial identity and multicultural competence, and so I taught a lot of the diversity and inclusion courses, but I also taught uh, research methods. I taught uh, standardized testing, um, 
I taught the practicum courses and supervised students who were going out into the um, various agencies in the Lehigh Valley to do their um, their internships and practicum experiences. So I remained very much con connected to all of the things that were uh, very important to my own personal development. And you've kind of made a shift in, in going from teaching to being the chancellor at Penn State Lehigh Valley. What an amazing career opportunity, I would imagine, but also really a change. So talk to me a little bit about that shift and what some of the the benefits, but also the challenges have been along the way. Sure. So for me, all of these things are connected. I was teaching in the classroom, and in the classroom, you're leading. And then I was on com various committees and chaired various committees, so you're again serving and leading. And the opportunity came up for me to um, to participate in a women's leadership program at HERS, uh, the Higher Education Resource Services Program develops women leaders. And so I was fortunate enough to be selected for that and to spend four weeks out of the summer, um, I, uh, I guess it was in 2008, um, meeting other women who didn't necessarily see themselves as, the mo as, as wanting to become the most senior level leaders, but we realized we were already leading. It wasn't that uh, we had come together to learn how to do something we hadn't already done. Almost putting framework around what you Absolutely. were doing, but formalizing it. Putting framework around it, building a network around it, and, and really stepping fully into our potential. Yeah. Um, and almost owning it. I mean, do you find that that's such an important thing? You work with so many young women now and Penn State Lehigh Valley Launchbox ladies. And I find you to be such an amazing proponent of young people, but in particular, I think young women. Um, how important was that for you in your development and kind of far along in your career to almost give it a name, to call it leadership? It was it was um, really a phenomenal and transformative experience to to sit in a room with uh, women who were like me and different from me, who um, had this sparkle in their eye for wanting to do something significant that would help others. So it was always about serving others. Um, but to be doing that in a way with permission, because leadership looked a certain way. Mm. Leadership at Lehigh University looked a certain way. And so the opportunity to, to just reflect on uh, what we were really capable of, given the credentials that we had, the access that we had, the opportunities that we could create, um, really put the frame around um, something that all of us benefited in that four-week period. It was pretty intense. Um, I went from that experience to becoming a, a fellow in the American Council on Education's leadership program. Um, for many people who go through the program, they become presidents and chancellors. And um, that was a year-long experience. Lehigh University, uh, Alice Gass gave me uh, a year sabbatical to travel around the country and uh, learn about higher ed leadership. I was hosted in that year by um, George Washington University in Washington, D.C. So. I had a lot of opportunity to to see the higher ed landscape um, without being responsible for everything <laughs> that I was seeing. I was also humbled by the experience uh, because in order to do that, I moved home with my parents wow. after decades of being <laughs> away. <laughs> Probably special time, though. It was very special time. Uh, it was a very special time. And during that year, unfortunately, my father passed away. So it was fortuitous that I was able to spend, mm -hmm. you know, a year with him. Yeah, kind of that everything comes full circle and happens for a reason. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then you, how did this opportunity come about at Penn State Lehigh Valley? So after my And did you think you'd be coming back to the Lehigh Valley? I never thought I would be coming back to the Lehigh Valley, but Lehigh Valley had become home. It was the home that my, the only home my children knew. I returned to Lehigh after my fellowship, and I had the opportunity to work with the president and pro, uh, provost on some important initiatives. And then I, you know, I, I got a call, and it was an opportunity to be an associate dean at uh, Drexel University. All right, I'm going to take a break there because I know that what happens next is very exciting. So we're going to leave the audience with that little cliffhanger. Okay. Uh, and we will be back with Dr. Tina Richardson in just a minute. 
You know, family time is about creating memories together to last a lifetime. And what better way to bond than spending time at some of the amazing attractions the Lehigh Valley has to offer? You know, you can cheer on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms or take a walk on the wild side at the Lehigh Valley Zoo. However you enjoy spending your free time, there's something here for every member of the family. For more information on things to do in the Lehigh Valley, head over to Discover Lehigh Valley's website at discoverlehighvalley.com. Okay, we're back with Dr. Tina Richardson. She left us with a little bit of a cliffhanger where she didn't think she'd be ended up, end up in the Lehigh Valley, came back to Lehigh, kind of had gone through this training program that often places people in a chancellorship. Is that a word? Yes. Thank you. Look at me. <laughs> uh, and then you got a call from Drexel. I, I received a call from Drexel. There was an opportunity to become the associate dean um, in the School of Education. And I jumped at the opportunity, but when I arrived, I introduced myself to the president. Um, and I, I said to him, I've been uh, really impressed with the work that, that I've become aware of that you're doing here. And uh, if there's any way I can help you implement your um, strategic vision for the, the uh, university, I'd be delighted to, to help. And he looked at me in a way that I didn't know what that meant. I, he looked at me as if to say, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Mm. And, it, and it, was a ver it was a pleasant look, but it was shocked. Uh, it turns out later uh, that um, he let me know very few people approach him that way. So he immediately put me to work on one of his strategic <laughs> initiatives, and I, um, w I became the inaugural uh, director of their university-assisted school effort. And so I was out in the community working with school principals, working with the superintendent, working with, um, with other administrators in the um, Philadelphia public school system, helping to transform schools. When you learn all of these things and you have this opportunity, I'm hearing you say something about being really a risk taker. Yes. Had you always been someone who would step up and or raise your hand in the classroom or speak up and say that you wanted to be a part of things? Or is that something you learned or forced yourself to do? I have always been one who's willing to take risks, but I am also very strategic. And so there are certain times when risks didn't look like they would pan out in ways that, that would make sense. Um, and then there are other times where I see something um, and I just say, why not? Uh, why not ask? Why not inquire? Um, and wouldn't it be an awesome opportunity if I was invited in? And so that's pretty much how I live life. I want to ask you a little bit about that because you've done a lot of work on diversity and inclusion. And as an African-American female um, and a woman of color, how important is it to ask for the seat at the table? And, and what role does that play sort of in your philosophy and what you kind of teach and train to other um, minority women around mm -hmm. you? So I think it's absolutely necessary for everyone to ask for what they want. You know, I hear stories about being tapped on the shoulder and someone saying, you know, I, I, I see this and that in you, and I want to give you this opportunity. I'm not sure that we generally have good vision to see all the potential in other people. Mm -hmm. And so it helps if you uh, lean in and you ask. It's almost always responded to in a positive way. And once you get used to asking and showing people what you're passionate about, you really get a lot of followers. You get a lot of supporters. If I hadn't learned to do that early on, um, I don't think I would be where I am today. But I had to learn how to do that because I was child number nine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. It's a great life skill. And I, I agree with that. I think that it's so important, especially when we're working with young people, college students, interns, um, you know, employees in the first few years of, of, of the job force, to encourage them to ask for what they want, to ask. Because really, what's the worst thing someone says? No. I mean, that's, exactly. that's what's going to happen. And, exactly. and maybe, and, and a lot of times it's not even 
no, it's not right now. Exactly. And I think that's an important message. So I'm so glad to hear that you, you did that and it paid off for you, which led you back to the Lehigh Valley, which is so <laughs> lucky for all of us. Uh, so tell me a little bit about Penn State Lehigh Valley and, and what you're doing there and what your initiatives are. So Penn State Lehigh Valley, again, was an opportunity that, um, that I saw as a result of having my eyes open. Um, when I learned that the chancellor position was available, I tossed my hat in the ring. And, uh, and I said, I'm coming home. And, and, you know, it's turned out to be one of the most phenomenal career decisions that um, I've ever made. When you think about the opportunity, um, the opportunities that I've had to do work nationally and internationally, all of the work was relevant in my backyard. Isn't that amazing? Exactly. It's amazing to see how the pieces of the puzzle will add up to really equate to what you need for this moment in time. Exactly. And so the opportunity came um, to me when my uh, kids were, um, my oldest was starting high school. And so I returned to the Lehigh Valley. I was close to home. Um, he continued, both of my kids continued um, their studies at Moravian Academy, and they were delighted to have uh, access to mom more frequently. Um, and so it worked out uh, wonderfully well. Uh, I will say that the Penn State Lehigh Valley campus really is a campus on the move. It's growing, um, double-digit growth for the past three years. It is um, highly visible now in the in the um, Lehigh Valley more so than it. It had been. really is. It's been it's been a pleasure to watch and to also not only get to know you and be a part of, as I mentioned earlier, you know, your sort of think tank incubator, Launchbox Ladies Series, but um, it's true. I mean, you really put this campus on the map. It's an exciting thing. Well, you know, with leadership, it's easy to think that uh, the person at the helm is the one that's making it happen, but it's a team effort. Um, I can't be everywhere. And uh, but I can share with my team the opportunities that I see, and then we brainstorm and we implement. The students, though, are are really the jewel. Mm -hmm. That's what inspires all of us to do what we do to promote the the, the campus. Let's talk a little bit about the Lehigh Valley because, as you'd mentioned, um, you know you worked here for many years. You've come and gone. You've traveled the world. What makes the Lehigh Valley home for you? What makes it special? So it's home for me because my kids were born here. The networks that I um, developed, you know, professionally, sometimes you can, you can transfer those to other places. But when you have your kids, your family grounded in a, pl a place, um, and then they become networked and you meet the parents of their friends and and you get involved with the school and you know you know the principal and you know all the teachers that's what makes it home uh the lehigh valley is growing so there are people moving in there are new opportunities it's much more vibrant i think uh, as a community than what it was when i came in 1991 but Many of those those uh, individuals that I met in 1991 are still here because this is a great place to claim. When you talk to other people and you travel around the world and you and you say, "Well, I'm from, you know, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania." Yes. What do you say to them about what this place is? How do you describe it? Well, one of the things that I always do is I invite people to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And so I have, you know, friends and colleagues that come from uh, other countries, from other continents, to visit the Lehigh Valley. And one of the things that I, I find to be quite interesting is that um, many of my international friends, they always send postcards or they reach out and they say, I'm in Bethlehem. No, they don't say Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> And they always get that reaction. What are you doing in Bethlehem? <laughs> that is funny. And so this place is really special. And um, it gives people from all over the world an opportunity to see what, what America looks like, um, you know, what Bethlehem looks like, what it's known for, and to learn more of the history of this region, of the country, and actually get to know on a personal level how we all 
are more connected than we are different. I love that, and I love the idea that the history plays a role. Tell me, you know, why the history of the Lehigh Valley is sort of unique and helps tell the story when people visit here. So I think it, it helps tell the story of the reality that uh, the U.S. is, is a, a collection of immigrant communities and individuals from all over the world. We're connected to any and all places. And um, you can only really know that if you take the time to get to know uh, various facets of the community. You could stay within your own ethnic group or religious community and never know, or you can just look out the window or go down the street and around the corner and you can see a, a, a piece of the world reflected here. I love that so much. So tell me what are some of your favorite things to do here? You get a visitor from out of town. Where do you take them? And you're just enjoying a, a Friday night with friends. Where do you go? So I'm enjoying a Friday night with friends. I, I will spend time at Arts Quest. I love um, the concerts, uh, particularly in the in the summer. Um, the opportunity to hear musicians sometimes that I've never heard of, but are th that are just phenomenal. Um, the opportunity to see the movies, the films that are, are showing there that are not the same ones that you see, um, you know, in the uh, traditional theaters. The opportunities that we have for music festivals. Um, the restaurant scene scene here is growing and dynamic. I remember moving here <laughs> in 2005. Yes. And I think there were about three good restaurants they would say yes. to go to. And now... You can't get through. You couldn't even get through every great restaurant in the Lehigh Valley in a year if you went out once a week. That's Absolutely, how, how good it is. So yeah, it's awesome. So and and then the 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 people. Um, there are a number of colleges and universities here, and so um, the universities bring a uh, a community. But then the industries that are here, the innovation that's here. You know, we, we're sitting in. It, it, doing a podcast in a, a very innovative space. Yeah. And so the opportunity to see the the economy grow, to see the population grow, to see, you know, the entertainment outlets um, become, you know, really a rival with many of the other um, cities that um, people celebrate. Well, Tina, it's been wonderful having you here, and that it leaves me with a very hopeful feeling uh, about the Lehigh Valley and about this region, and, and really about the future, because you're working with so many of, of the future workforce and the future community members here in the Lehigh Valley. So thank you for all that you do at Penn State Lehigh Valley. Thanks thank for you. joining us on Unscripted. My pleasure. Hey, are you looking for a place unlike any other? Well, enjoy the twists and turns of Dorney Park, explore a new world underground at Lost River Caverns, or create colorful memories at the Crayola Experience. Whatever you decide, Discover Lehigh Valley is your source to finding out what's happening in our area. To find a new adventure, check out their website at discoverlehighvalley.com. All right, I am joined here by Dr. Tina Richardson from Penn State Lehigh Valley. Tina, thanks for being with us. Uh, we are going to do rapid fire questions. Can you confirm for our audience you have never heard these questions before? I can confirm just that. Are you nervous? I'm nervous. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. All right, if you won the lottery, what is the first thing you would do? The first thing I would do would be to create a scholarship fund to make sure that I could help people who are ambitious but uh, limited in resources get the best <sighs> education they can. Love that. What is one food that you cannot live without? Oh, I absolutely love fruits and, and berries. And so if I if somebody removed that from my diet, I don't know. I don't think. Do you have a favorite fruit in that list? I love strawberries. I love blueberries. <laughs> Do you go to the Blueberry Festival? I go to the Blueberry There stuff. you have it. All right. Historic yes. Bethlehem Blueberry Absolutely. Festival. That's a good one. All right. Which actress would you cast to play you in a movie about your life? Carrie Washington. Carrie Washington. Nice choice. <laughs> if you didn't have the job you have now, what would you be doing instead? I would uh, try my hand at becoming a comedian. Really? You know right. that they have Arts Quest does this stand-up open mic night. I, I do. All right. I need I'm, a group I'm of people to go with to All right. I will go with you because <laughs> I'm going to pay attention to that. I'll have you know that as a junior in high school, I actually did a stand-up act for my high school talent show. 
It's a little little known fact about me. <laughs> All right, your favorite hobby or pastime? I absolutely love basketball. All right. I love playing basketball, and I still do. I'm just a lot slower, <laughs> and I love watching basketball. TV or live? Both. All right, name one person who has inspired you. I think my mother probably inspired me more than anybody else. Well, your mother has certainly inspired me because anybody who can have 10 children in 17 years who all went on to get a college degree and have amazing professional lives deserves a lot of credit. So kudos to your mother. All right, Dr. Tina Richardson, thank you for being here and enjoying our rapid fire questions. Thank you. All right, everybody, you've been listening to Unscripted with Russo, my wonderful guest, Dr. Tina Richardson. And uh, until next time. Liked what you saw? Subscribe to our channel so you never miss another video. To see more of The Peak TV, check out our website, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and catch us on WFMZ Channel 69.